Uh, seven o'clock, I know we'll have a couple of other folks join. So how's everybody doing today? We good? Good. Awesome. We're good. <laughs> um, as an intro, and you know, what I usually try to do is to go through this. This is actually it's not just me doing this. This is for everybody to help each other out. But I put this list of items up for everybody to take a look at. First, I am going to record this session, just so you know, because we'll take this. I'll put it on YouTube for anybody else that couldn't make the session so they can hear the questions that are being asked and see how that goes through. If there's any uh, questions or challenges, let me know. Um, the intent is that you get to ask questions and somebody else, hopefully on the group, can answer the questions or we can go back to the Facebook-based groups or the others and ask people to, to help with the questions. But usually what I find is there's somebody within the group that's tried it, done it, or is considering it, and it usually makes for some good discussion. Uh, I would ask that if you're not talking, uh, especially if you have kids, dogs, or construction, whatever it might be in the background, that you mute yourself. But feel free to unmute, ask questions, talk, participate as you go through. Uh, we want this to be interactive so that it's not just going through a couple of questions that I've gathered, uh, but it's a chance for you to meet other Best Cat members, uh, ask questions, talk about technical things, like we'll get into you know, electricity, we'll get into towing. Uh, those are some of the questions that came up, but also other people asking, where's your favorite place to go? What do you want to learn? How do I do X, Y, and Z? Um, and the others we go through also assume positive intent. So occasionally, it doesn't happen as much in this session or these types of sessions, uh, but I'll have this more in other groups that I've run in. Somebody will make a comment, and it sometimes feels um, like, I'm not sure why Wayne said that, uh, but I ask everybody to assume positive intent, that the person making the statement or asking the question is really trying to either help or trying to figure something out. And coming from that standpoint, it makes it much easier to say, not quite sure where they came from. Let me ask more questions. Let me see if I can help out. Because uh, the intent is to be able to come back and be a group that's supportive and helping each other out on that side. Um, any questions on kind of the focus for tonight as we'll go through some questions and then get into others? Awesome. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment just so I can see how many people have joined in. Uh, I think we have 11 so far. Uh, I think there are about 30 people that have signed up, so they were coming. So we may have some folks that kind of filter in, filter out. Uh, so there's uh, Pierre joining in from now and just kind of go from there. So welcome. My name is Wayne Bogan. Um, I'm simply doing this because I have a Basecamp 20X that I got last summer. I had lots of questions. I've learned some things along the way. I don't have all the answers. But if you get in and there's a question you have, feel free to ask those. And somebody's probably dealt with it. They've either been in other campers, they're new, new to the base camp, or they've had a base camp for a while. Um, I was chatting a little bit with Cass, who has uh, Tales of Wonderlust. She said she was going to try and join tonight if she could. Depending on her schedule, I think she's in class working on some things there. So she may or may not be able to get in. But uh, feel free to come in and, and go through the questions. Uh, what I'll do is I have a, a short list of questions compared to the February session that we did that we'll walk through those first to kind of get us started, uh, see what uh, other questions you have from there. And then I'll open it up to you as a group. Uh, and then we'll go from there. This may last 30 minutes. This mass may last two or three hours. It's totally up to you as to how you want to do it. So does that work for everybody? Thumbs up if that's a good? Awesome, okay. So let me uh, go back to share again and I will start with the questions that had come up. All right. So the first question somebody had was around insurance. And the third version was, you know, I know that you can get different pricing from different people. And they were asking for other members of the community to come back and to tell them, hey, this is what I paid. This is what I did and how I did it. Um, so at the end of the day, should I expect to be paying a thousand a year, two thousand a year? What's your deductible, et cetera? Um, I do have pulled up my insurance policy that I could show from Progressive, but I want to see if anybody else wanted to jump in and just talk about what you're paying, because I expect it's going to vary somewhat different from state to state. So anybody want to jump in and cover what you did with insurance to help out Dave for his question? 
Um, we purchased our insurance through State Farm for the base camp. Um, we also have many of our, our car policies and house policies with them. So we do have that advantage, but annually we are paying $584. Okay. Excellent. Anybody else? We have a uh, nationwide, I went with it. Uh, that's where our mortgage is or our house is. Um, I don't know what it covers or doesn't cover. You know, I'd love to have a more in-depth as far as what insurance we need to have as far as like coverages or whatnot. I think I pay nine fifty to a thousand a year. I'm in Colorado. Anybody else like to share? Um, our our base camp is insured with our auto policy in, in a bundle. And I believe it added somewhere in the $500 range. The, the number you, you quoted sounded about right. And uh, we do have full replacement coverage and a $500 deductible. And uh, that's in Pennsylvania. Now the liability goes with the the uh, the car or the truck. So that's for for just the uh, damage to the vehicle, to, to the base camp. Thank you. Any others? Okay, I'll um, I'll actually pull mine up. So I did mine through Progressive. I have uh, USAA for my insurance for the house, cars, and the others. Had that for. I guess 30 years now. And so I just went back to USA, but they have farmed it back out to progressive. So my total for the year is 564. And so if I go up, uh, mine was a total loss replacement. Uh, they have these things they call disappearing deductibles, but for comprehensive and for, uh, I think this is collision, the cost was the 252 for comprehensive, 248 for the collision. Uh, it includes um, I guess fire department service up to a thousand dollars. I did add in two thousand of emergency expense. It was another eleven dollars. So that way, if I sometimes need to go to a hotel room with the others, that was just something to potentially help cover some of those costs. Um, vacation liability. Um, it was twenty five k that I potentially get back. Now, how well, how much of that you would actually get back? You could see, but that was another six. Uh, then it's a Let's see, 5,000, I'm not sure how this shows up here. It didn't print out well. I'll have to pull that up, but it was a $100 deductible on this piece. And I think that may be tied back to the vacation liability. Um, and then I didn't include any personal effects uh, or other items because I was just going to, most everything else, I'm not carrying that much stuff with the base camp. I was more worried about the cost of the base camp versus the few clothes or things that I would have in there. Uh, and then... It does have pest damage was an option as well. It's another 15 for 5,000 in coverage up to $250. So looking at that, that's probably, yeah, I'm not sure what the two is between those two. But that gives you a little bit of an idea of things that I covered. I didn't cover the roof because we have an aluminum roof versus the other air streams and how that fits in. So Dustin, you have a question? Yeah. Hey, Wayne, when you were going through that policy, were these riders that you added or were these just sort of the base policy that they have? Yeah, I think it's the base policy. It was just check boxes that you could go through and in the web page and you just chose those options. And these are the charges for this. Good question. All right. So hopefully that'll help Dave out in looking at, so we've heard around the 500 range for several folks up to a um, thousand, I think for Dustin that you're looking at in Colorado. So they give you an idea of kind of where you're starting from and what you're looking at. Okay, next was towing. So we had two questions. Uh, one was, has anybody installed a weight distribution hitch? And the other is, I have a blue ox. Uh, will this one fit or do I need to get one of the other options? Uh, so we can talk about, let's just talk in general about who has installed weight distribution hitch or sway bars, depending on what you've installed, uh, what brand and model that you put on what you like or don't like about it. And then if anybody has any experience with the blocks, we can talk to that one. If not, we may have to do some research just to see the difference between these two. Anybody use a weight okay. distribution hitch? 
Yes, we have a weight distribution hitch. We tow our base camp with a, um, a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee and uh, we used one uh, with the square friction bars. I do not know right now about the uh, it's an equalizer. The, the, yeah, or other. the uh, the brand. I saw it today when I was digging through the stuff. I can look it up for you if you if somebody would like to know. Uh, but you you can't put the conventional like chain type latches on because of the um, the way the propane tank cover and propane tanks mount. You need one of the square bars that drop down below the hitch. Um, I think it's I, an equalizer brand. I, I believe so reason. too. Yes, I can look to be sure. And do you think it's worthwhile to have it on? Yes. Uh, we have, now, when I pull the the vehicle with the truck, you, you know, obviously it's a truck. You don't you don't need that. But but it's a little bit squirrely to to uh, try it with a lighter with a lighter tow vehicle, even though the Jeep says it can tow 7,000 pounds, we know that the safe limit is half that. So um, the, the weight distribution is, I would say, very important, critical almost. I think Jeep recommends anything over 3,000 pounds to have a weight distribution hitch for the, for the Jeep anyway. I'm not sure about um, other vehicles. I'd love to hear your experiences with that exact hitch. Because I, I ordered that. I'm 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 going to be picking up my base camp um, next month, and and I ordered that hitch. And so, just curious how how you like it, or is there any caveats, or how, like do you need to detach the, the those bars for backing up, or going any kind of off road or anything? The only thing you would need to be very careful of if you did a if you went through a severe ditch, uh, it would be a little bit problematic uh backing up as long as you keep the vehicle as long as you keep the the combination fairly straight there doesn't seem to be a reason to take them off um but they do come off easily as long as you jack the as long as you use the jack to take some weight off the ball before you try to remove them or, or put them back on cool thanks Brad. um anybody else using weight distribution here I've used the, uh, the the equalizer as well, and um, um, it works fine once I hook it on. The sway bars uh, take a little uh, a little muscle to get them on. As for you, I mean, you've all, you're all seasoned RVers. It takes a little uh, a nudge to to kick them back in there. But once once the grease kicks in, um, then it's easy. I've had a couple issues with the coupler. But I think it's just because when I back my truck up, the ball is not right in the middle. So I kind of move it like a, like a half an inch forward underneath. And then I, then I lower the coupler down and then I kind of will go to the truck and put the truck in reverse for like a, a half of a second just to get the coupler in there and, and then it locks in. Um, but I haven't um, had any issues uh, with the equalizer as well. Um, so far, it works great. Wayne, I, I've, I have the equalizer also. Um, I, uh, I towed without it for just a little while. And, you know, it, it seemed to be fine. Not a lot of problems, but you would get sort of a porpoising type of effect whenever you go over, you know, uneven uh, areas to whatever. And... Uh, now that I have it installed and I'm towing with it, uh, I would not tow with that. I, I just think it's awesome. And um, I just really feel safe in all conditions. And I have towed in the mountains of Colorado. Um, <laughs> probably what's worse than that is towing in, in metro areas and in, in heavy traffic when you really sometimes are forced to make a sudden turn or something. And I almost feel like that my, I, I tow with a F-150 King Ranch with a 3.5 liter Echo Boost with all the tow stuff. But I feel like that it almost, it almost operates as a single unit. I mean, I honestly, and I don't want to get dramatic here, but I honestly feel like right after I had it put on, 
it saved me from a major accident for sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Dustin, looks like you got your hand raised. Uh, yeah, so I have the Anderson. Um, I just, excuse me, sorry, my radio. I just picked up last week. Um, I've never had a trailer before or any of that stuff. Um, I will say when I picked up the camper, it's a lot bigger than you think. I'm real. I bought an F-150 and it, it's a good 20, 20 feet. It feels like, um, the Anderson, they had to add a link. Um, I don't know if that degrades the, you know, the, the tensile strength of the, the chain, but as far as putting it on, taking off seems very easy. Um, we haven't had any problems doing that. It's more the effort of jacking up and down to do it. Um, but as far as tightening, um, I do tow with an F-150. It seems to be feel fine behind it with the Anderson. So uh, the question I have, and I don't know if anybody knows this, the guy said not to put grease on the top of the ball. Does that sound familiar? Anybody with the Anderson? Does anybody know this? He said, no grease, that friction's supposed to be there and that's how it is. So I don't know if anyone knows that offhand. <laughs> Sneak in my yeah. question. I've looked at it a couple of times, Dustin, and I've seen some of the other manufacturers say not to put grease on top of the ball. Um, and so I had actually bought, uh, I think, I don't know what kind of grease it was. It was a uh, white lithium or something else that I was going to use that was going to cover the heat and the friction and it got dirty, but I couldn't tell the difference with or without that on there. Granted, it was new connecting up to the base camp and everything's new at that point. So it wouldn't have as much, but I've seen several people say not to do it, uh, but I've seen others that do it all the time. And I don't know that it makes that much of a difference. It's kind of one of those minor dials that you tweak and tune. It might provide some benefit but I don't know a good answer on it for you. Um, but I was, I was uh, reading some articles at some point um, when I was researching the hitches. And I remember specifically about the Anderson, the article said to not use grease because it uses the friction from the ball as, as in its anti, the way it does anti-sway, it relies on that friction because it doesn't have actually friction bars um, like, the, like the equalizer, for example. Um, so that's just my, something I read about. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, that's not the what, diamond, what, right. One other comment about um, the weight distribution hitch. Uh, it's already been mentioned that you need to jack it up, you know, where it's actually at an angle like this between the tow vehicle and the, um, and the base camp. So I, uh, the, 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 um, the front jack that comes with the base camp is only rated for 2,000 pounds, and I replaced that. I got, it's, it's called Bulldog, and it's rated for 5,000 pounds. It's not expensive, extremely easy to replace. I mean, it's three bolts, that's it. And uh, I feel much better, much more secure with that than just the 2,000-pound rated uh, jack that, that it comes with from Airstream. Yeah, David, that's a great point. And I ended up changing out my jack, not because of the equalizer I put on, but just because I wanted something that was electric versus cranking. Yeah. After a couple of times in the rain and cranking, I was tired of doing that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's you do on the equalizer, it does have to lift up a little bit to release tension on the bar so that you can get those loose. Um, so I did install the equalizer as well. Uh, I ended up because it was the only one I could find needing the 12K version, which was way more than I needed, but just in case yeah. I ever bought another one, and that's all that the, the dealer had at the time. Uh, it is also as noisy, right? I don't know if y'all run into it, but uh, the equalizer, my, my brother laughed because he pulls with a, a big fifth wheel with his big truck, and I pulled in, he, saw, he said, I heard you a half a mile away squeaking as you came around the corner. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad, but you know, he was trying to pick on me. But it, it is noisier when you pull back in with that equalizer. There are these little pads you can buy that are like $15 off Amazon that fits on the little bracket where the bar sits on that does decrease a lot of the noise, but couldn't get rid of it 100%. I started without a weight distribution hitch, uh, was going down to, to Hilton Head, South Carolina, driving down the road on the interstate and decided I was gonna pass a big tanker that was going much slower than I was. Uh, Thought I had plenty of ramp, got into the middle lane, and then all of a sudden a heel caught up to me before I knew it, and I'm doing side to side with the tanker. He, well, actually, he was closer to the back of the base camp and to me, and then all these cars going beside me, and I felt the back end of the truck starting to move. And at that point, I decided 
I'm getting something that can handle the sway on that side. Uh, lots of people tow without it and never use weight distribution hitches. It really didn't help my Chevy Tahoe to have any weight distribution. I really wanted it for the sway. But as David said, going down the road, the difference I feel now prior to the, uh, the hitch being on, uh, I could be driving down the road if an 18 wheeler or even some of the cars drove by, I could feel my Tahoe kind of go to the right side of the road from the air pressure with the equalizer. I don't feel it anymore. It, it's just, it's still solid. I think as somebody said with the truck going down the road and to me, it's just easier. Occasionally I'll drive without it, but if I'm going through the mountains of Tennessee or if I ever go out west with it, yeah, I'll make sure that I have my um, sway bars on before I go out. I had a question regarding the uh, weight distribution hitch. The installation, did, did people ha do people have to take off the uh, propane shroud to do that? I, I did not. And um, if you do a search, I think I posted pictures of mine. But just as the shroud, if this is the, um, uh, the frame, the shroud comes out a little bit on the outside around where the tanks are and right underneath that part where it had come up when the shroud comes away from the, uh, the frame, there was just enough space for me to put it up in there. I took the shroud off to put it on and just set the shroud back on, tighten it back down and it worked perfectly. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Matt, your hand was up first. Yeah, so I had a question for David. David, did you notice a difference between the standard hitch and the bulldog like did you test both before or did you just did you just automatically get the bulldog um well i used the the one that came with the base camp i used that for quite a you know for probably three or four months and uh actually <laughs> i had a little problem that i had to replace it so um i was i was uh kind of boondocking at a harvest host facility that was out in this field and it rained like you wouldn't believe it was getting muddy and I wanted to get out of there and I forgot to raise my jack and it bent it so I had to replace it anyhow so I, I decided to go ahead and get a 5,000 pound while I was at it because I'd read some you know I'd read some comments about needing uh, something stronger yeah, I mean, the only reason I bring it up is because we're, we live in California, but we want to do like these long trips to like Michigan, you know, going through the Rockies or, um, and I just didn't know if we need one or not. Um, I don't know. I was just thinking out loud about that. So. So, so now I'm talking about the Jack, you know, on the front of the uh, of the base camp where you um, lift the base camp up and down. So I'm right. not sure. I'm, I don't quite understand why. Um, I don't know. Well, when you, I, I felt like when you said it's a 5,000 pound, it could tolerate up to 5,000 pounds. I thought it was like a, like an added protection, I guess. And, I, and I'm new to the whole RV experience. Yeah, yeah. It's just the, to when, when you jack it up with a weight distribution hitch on it, like the equalizer, you're actually lifting both your truck and the trailer. So there's okay, a lot yeah. of weight. And so that was why I went to the, the higher rated one. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I agree with David. The, the, the factory hitch is just a little wimpy feeling for that. The, uh, I, I got a bulldog on another trailer of mine very much the same way as David did. And I liked that a whole lot better. But David, do you know, I, I'm looking at the e-trailer website right now, and, and um, they have a few different Bulldog 5,000 pound jacks listed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, off the top of your head, which one it might be? Is it, is it a top winch or a, or a side winch? So, yeah, so, so you have to be careful. No, it can't be top because uh, that way mm -hmm. you would you would jack it, in, you, you would turn it into the um, propane tank shroud. So it has to be side, okay. side crank. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, they have two side ones. They have a zinc one that's like it's more of a silver color, and then like more one that's more of a gray color. Um. I honestly, I I, I can't help you there I, unless I looked at. I don't I don't know what the difference is. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> just wondering if you have to have your head. Mine. Mine is. Mine is just, 
silver. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, David. No, I'm I'm done. I'm done. Like I say, I ended up getting an electrical one that was called a Phoenix for me trailer. Um, and if you do a search for me in the base camp group, you should see which one it was that I've already posted because I wanted one that was electric and it's 4,000 pounds versus the five that David has. But, but he's right is that um, I, when I was looking for, I've got a picture somewhere and I was trying to find it that I've posted in the base camp group. To, to release the tension on the bars, you have to leave the trailer hooked to your vehicle, leave it latched, and then you actually have to raise the jack and that raises not only the trailer, it raises the back of your truck. So you've got the extra weight of the truck that's, that's the concern for the extra weight because the, the trailer itself may only be 550 pounds on the front unless you've overloaded it. But then you've got the back of the vehicle. So does that add another 500, 1,000, 1,500 pounds? I, yeah. I don't know. It depends on the vehicle. Yeah, Dustin? Yeah. Hey, so I guess just two things for me with the Anderson, um, I will say for those that don't have, um, haven't hooked up one yet. And as a new person to do it, um, I'd say it took me about 10 minutes to learn it. It's very easy to use. So I think, uh, if anyone is kind of on the fence, whether they want to get one or not, I would jump on one. Um, the follow-up question I have, when has anyone taken it to the scales? Have we seen how much weight is actually getting moved with some of these? I haven't done it yet. And I'm really kind of curious to see how, uh, how much is actually moving. Um, I've taken my, I've weighed mine at the scale without my hitch. I have not tried it with the hitch. So I, I need to do that. So I can share, and I'm looking to see if I've got the, the photo, uh, what, what was in there, but uh, I don't know how much of a difference it took off. Anybody else that weighed before well, and after? I, I did not uh, actually weigh them at scales. But I do know that as you're setting the hitch up, it's very critical to take careful measurements of the front and rear axles of the of the tow vehicle to be sure that that the the weight that the that the front of the vehicle doesn't lift that your that your steer tires uh, keep about the same amount of weight on them as they do when the vehicle does not have a trailer on it. Maybe a little bit of compression on the back, but the, the weight distribution is there to keep the, the, the weight from coming off the front axle of the car or truck. Yeah. Any other um, feedback on the weight or the weight distribution hitches? Okay. Anybody with experience on the blue ox? Okay. Well, this is um, this is the first time I went to the scale with my base camp. Uh, no weight distribution hitch. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot loaded into it. I mean, we had some clothes and things in, fairly centered, uh, back toward the the bathroom. Uh, a lot of the stuff was in the back of my truck in the Tahoe. But the, the base camp itself was 38.7. I, I just put the Tahoe on the first scale. I put the base camp on the second one. I didn't try to maneuver all three across the three different plates at the scale. And so that gives you an idea of what the overall weight was between those, because you also need to consider your vehicle's uh, total combined gross weight and make sure you're not exceeding that. With the base camp, you usually probably not, unless you've got a, a smaller car that may not have as much of a, a load to pull. Uh, but yeah, I'll try the next time I go out and see if I can't do a comparison and post it in the group of what this previous weight was and then do one with a weight distribution hitch and see what the difference was. All right, so I think the next question, Dustin King, then from you was exterior maintenance. Um, Walver Nice, engineers, a lot of people know about it. It's something Airstream recommends to use for washing and for waxing. They have different products. It's a little more expensive than what you're going to get for some of the other stuff. Uh, but could you just drive into a big car spray wash, spray it down with a power washer, garden hose, towels, et cetera? What does everybody do as far as washing their base cap? Anybody want to help out on that one? David, you do a lot of traveling, especially snow and everything else. Yeah, and that's a yeah I... Uh... Yeah, I use the big, 
you got to watch for the overhead. But when I was in Brackenridge, I found a place there in Frisco that was open even in the extremely cold weather. And uh, they had a they had a one bay that was extremely large, and I would just pull in there and just just use the. I wouldn't even wash it down. I would just spray it down. I was just trying to get you know any any um, you know just surface dirt off and everything. Actually, as I sit here in my base camp right now, I'm thinking this through because I really do need to give it a good good solid washing. I really do. So I'm interested in the subject. Anybody else? We put our 14 year old in charge of a light household duty pressure washer once. And, and, a, and a brush, soft brush and soap. Yeah. Uh, he, he whined about it like any 14 year old would, <laughs> but it seems to work for in between. Yeah. It, other than what, keeping the solar panels clean, we really haven't washed it that much. Um, but we're really not super clean vehicle kind of people. So um, we like a patina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did, how did you clean your solar panels? I, I, I get up with a, uh, a step ladder and a, just a squeegee and, and warm water. They get really crusty, more so than I thought they would. Yeah, yeah. Did you see a lot of degradation as far as the power you were bringing in before and after you cleaned it? Absolutely. A little bit of dirt makes a huge difference. Yeah, for mine, I've used a combination of just auto, uh, regular auto wash with a, uh, a soft either brush or sponge, and I always go side to side, I never do the circular motion. Uh, I think I've watched one of the Airstream videos where they talked about cleaning your vehicle and they tell you not to do circular like you normally would. So any of those that love the karate kids, that doesn't work because it can scratch up uh, the exterior. And so I just go side to side always. Uh, for cleaning the top, I've got a, uh, a brush um, that I had bought a long time ago from my car. It's really soft bristles that you would hook a hose to it and have soap. And really I, was, I wasn't even connecting a hose to it. Now, that's what I use for the top of the base camp, especially for cleaning the, the solar panels. I can just go up on a step ladder. Um, I'll put some soapy water, whether I've used the Walburnize uh, cleaner or just the auto cleaner, and I'll just use that to lightly go over top the top of the vehicle and to get the solar panels cleaned. Um, there is a bit of a difference when they do get dirty. Um, I didn't see a huge amount difference, but it wasn't super dirty. I hadn't been out on trails where you can get covered in dirt, um, but I did see somebody else post in a different Facebook group today. They had uh, 3,400 watts of solar on their fifth wheel. And when they were only bringing in, uh, I think it was about 2,400 watts, they cleaned their solar panels and then they went up to like 3,200 watts. So I don't know what wow. percentage is, but it was a good 20 to 30% loss of power by dirty panels. So you're gonna get some just the way that they function. Uh, I do have the Walburnize wax that I'm going to do. I've seen a lot of people post about ceramic coating their base camp uh, because it's supposed to make it so much easier, but I'm just going to come in for now, wash it, and then I'll wax it when I'm not so lazy on a nice weekend and get it lined up. Uh, but just regular car wash and soft, soft sponges or, or brushes for me so far. Uh, I would... I think, Dustin, the only concern I would have in a power washer is just, is I think about the windows, especially on the side, how they close. If you happen to hit it to the side too much, you could probably get water going through that seal and getting on the inside of the trailer. I, I don't know that it would hurt the outside of the trailer, but I'd worry about getting water inside. Any other thoughts on maintenance? Okay. Next question, how do you wire an inverter to power the 110 outlet while boondocking? Um, interesting question. Has anybody done this that's on the call? Yes. I didn't do it myself. I had it done by my dealer. So I yeah, put it in. David, how they lined it up? 
So I put in a 2000 watt uh, progressive inverter and they, um, but it's only powering my GF, my ground fault interrupt type uh, outlets. So there's, you know, not all the outlets, the one on the outside, <clears throat> the one by the sink and the one in the rear, I believe are all powered. Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's how it works. Just, just the ones that are on that breaker. I, I had a little bit of a debate with them about them doing that. You know, I felt like it should, with 2,000 watts, I could probably have a little bit more, maybe a few other 110 outlets, but they said that that was the way it had to be done. So I didn't argue with them, let them do it. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, and, and I, I do a lot of electrical work in my normal in my normal normal day to day job, and they did have like sound reasoning for uh, only doing that one circuit, and that circuit is what I did also. Uh, I, I put a thousand watt inverter in uh, simply because of, of battery size. We did not go with the lithium ion; we kept the the AGMs, uh, the AGMs that came from the factory, and uh, to put a, a a larger inverter would in my opinion, stress the batteries too much, make them, uh, make your runtime very small. Uh, so with the, with the pass-through style inverter, like I'm, I'm guessing you put in, David, that's controlling one circuit up to, in my case, 15 amps, but it would be a single right. circuit inverter. And uh, now you could do it with a larger inverter like you did if you chose to do the entire uh, the entire trailer with a transfer type device, but uh, but yes, I did it. Uh, I got mine from uh, it was a Progressive Dynamics. I got it through eTrailer. Same same for me. Uh, mine was Progressive Dynamics. I will tell you the and so this was a scenario where I actually bought the inverter. I bought the Battleborn lithium ion batteries. I bought a soft start. And I took it with me. I had all the product and I took it with me to when I picked up my trailer. And I worked out a deal with them where in return for the AGM batteries, you know, because they obviously are mine, right? But I let them keep them and I gave them. A, so we did a swap and, and, uh, and they put it in. And I, and I had the Progressive uh, Industries uh, in, uh, inverter and the first one failed. So, and they kind of, obviously, um, they work a lot with, with progressives. So they knew the people, they called them and they sent a second one in. It failed. So uh, they called them again, went through the scenario, make sure it wasn't an installation problem. They sent a third one and it worked. And I'm not sure what, what happened, but I will, I will say that Progressive handled this whole situation unbelievable. Uh, they actually, so because the dealer spent a lot of labor hours trying to get, uh, you know, an inverter that I provided installed, they spent extra labor in this whole scenario. So when they gave me an invoice, Progressive told me to send it to them and they reimbursed me 100% for that extra cost. Nice. And, I got, and I got a really nice letter from their VP of sales. You know, I mean, everybody has problems. I think, I think they, they have a good product, you know, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it was circuit boards or it, it seemed to be that kind of problem. Um, and, you know, there's been a real shortage of those, um, but, but whatever, they did the right thing. And, and I mean, it was like 500 and some odd dollars that they reimbursed me for. Any other experience with inverters and 110 power? I, I will uh, say, I don't know how, your, how yours is located, David. But I was mm -hmm. able to mount mine vertically next to the batteries inside of the yeah. 
inside of that compartment uh, by cutting vents in the in that wall above and below so it could breathe. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And then um, I did put vent screen in there to keep you know stuff out of the out of that compartment. Right. Uh, right. We also need to be sure you beef up the cabling that connects the two batteries together uh, because the the number six wire that they use between batteries yeah. i don't believe is heavy enough that was right. a, something that running running that's running through my head okay yeah and they also provided i guess an external panel that's right outside of that area that's you know i can turn the inverter on and off yes i i uh could kind of feel your pain when you said uh, the first the first inverter failed because I mm -hmm. had it all put together and when I pushed the button on that remote I could not get it to turn on and uh. and I was bent out of shape <laughs> it turns out I was holding the button too long and forcing it to uh. shut back off <laughs> it took me a few minutes to figure that out <laughs> Scott where are you located can I hire you and do my inverter install the, the airstream dealer is just joins a fortune for everything they want to do <laughs> Uh, I live in central Pennsylvania, so if, if you bring it here, I'd be happy to do it. I haven't done it. I'm getting ready to do it. Um, and so my plan is I end up going to, and I switched, and I'm going to go with 24 volt batteries. Uh, Sterling and one of the groups had posted that he had gone with 24 volt, did some research, looked at all the different options, and it does require a change coming in and going back out, especially with 12 volt DC. But it went through and worked with the Victron equipment. And so I'm gonna put in two 24 volt batteries there. Uh, it'll end up giving me a little over 800 amp hours of power for significantly less than 12 volt batteries. So I've got 800 amp hours of power with the two 24 volt versus three battle borns at the 12 volt that would, uh, at the same price would give me about 300 amp hours. But what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, it requires me to get a, a, a Victron MultiPlus as the inverter coming in so that I can take the 30 amp and then I'll take it and it'll have a feed going out to the 110 and it'll have a feed going to the 12 volt DC and it has the power assist such that if, if the power I'm using in the trailer and, and I've never done this up to this point, I usually never use more than about 14, 15 amps for when I've done some testing. Uh, the power coming in, if, if it's... If I start pulling 35 amps of power in the trailer for whatever reason, run the air conditioner, I plug in the coffee pot and my wife plugs in the hair dryer, right? The, the MultiPlus will actually start pulling power from the batteries to augment the power from the short power to offset that. Now, will I ever need that? Probably never will, but I always have a tendency to over-engineer things anyway. Just, Scott, I think to your point, that as I look at the, the diagrams for the power cables, and I was uh, trading messages with Sterling about his setup that he's using. He's like, oh, you just need two, two aught cables going from the battery. I'm like, well, why wouldn't I just use four aught? Well, it's more expensive, but why wouldn't I use four aught cable going back over unless I'm missing something? So I got to dig a little bit more into it, but I'm going to bring in the 30 amp connection. I'm actually going to put a, a 30 amp breaker prior to, to the MultiPlus, bring it into the MultiPlus. From there, I'm going to go over to the batteries for charging because it has a 70 amp charger. And then I'm gonna do a, a connection over to the 110 uh, and I've got to size that cable. So I'll need to replace what's there and make sure everything's good. And then I'm gonna go over to the 12 volts. And so I um, didn't get to it today, but I'm gonna take and lay everything out in the garage, take some pictures and post it in the Basecamp and the Basecamp 20X group so everybody can see it. And then as I build it, I'm gonna create a video. Um, I've got a little shop where I have a sub panel and so I'm going to kill the power there and I'm going to pull a 30 amp feed out of that panel down to the MultiPlus so that I can actually set everything up and test it before ever putting it in the base camp. Because it'd be my luck that these are bigger and it's not all going to fit in the, the space that you have today. So I'm going to have to figure a way to put a longer board in to cover it up. Uh, and then as I post and do the work, as folks see things, you might say, wait a minute, you're using 10 gauge, that should be at least six gauge or that should be X. And so people can catch things as I'm going through. But I'll probably, if I read the specs and it says I need a six gauge, I'll probably put in a four gauge or a two gauge just to make sure uh, so that I don't run into problems and I'm going to fuse just about everything along the way 
in case I run into any problems on that. So I, I did download a diagram from explorers.life where you can go through, get his, and he goes in extreme detail of how to lay everything out. Um, but I'll post that so that you can see. And then I'll be coming back probably one, asking questions to people afterwards of why doesn't this work? And then two, showing how I did it in case it helps somebody else after that. Uh, but it should be interesting to see if the 24 volt comes in because one of the things that I didn't think about when I bought the batteries in the inverter is that the two panels on the top of the, the base camp today are two 90 watt 12 volt panels. They're wired in parallel, which means it's gonna come down as individuals, right? Because And you want that for shading. Because if you put them in series, if there's any shading or dirt on one panel, it cuts the power for the other coming down. So you essentially lose it. But I have watched, because I do have um, the VE Direct on my charge controller, and I might have 40 volts coming down from the panels at peak, and then I'll drop down to 17, and then I'll go back up. It kind of goes up and down as you're going through. Um, and then Sterling, I think, had posted that he was seeing that same thing, and I think the Victron that I bought, the, the MultiPlus, is a 24-volt uh, MultiPlus. So the minimum I think it's going to need is 24 volts. I've got to dig through the documentation. So if for whatever reason, my two panels are coming down at 12 volts and they're only delivering 17 at that point, it's not going to charge the batteries. So I'm probably going to have to change and put my panels from parallel into series so that it will up the voltage and keep the amps down and just see how that fits in. But uh, I, as I do things, I'll post those for people to see. If you see I'm doing something wrong, tell me. If you want to learn, ask questions, I'll tell you what I'm doing and we'll see if it's right or not. Because uh, Scott, you're probably a lot more knowledgeable electrical. Neil, who's joined our previous call, I think works for a power company. He's been a, a lot more knowledgeable. And I think some of you folks will see what I'm doing. But my intent is to power the entire base camp. And it was really so that I could go easily five, six days without any shore power and without a generator with just a little bit of power coming in from the solar panels, I may add more panels over time to kind of add a trickle charge back into it to keep things up. Uh, but you know, 15 minutes of a hairdryer and the occasional, I don't know, coffee pot or something else that won't run very long, turn those on, but I won't try to run the air conditioner off of it, it's just using some of these other appliances. So we'll see, so we'll see how it works out. Uh, Dustin, looks like you had a question. Yeah, hi. So I'm hoping I can ask a, an ad hoc, ad hoc question with the electrical yeah, people absolutely. here. Um, it's not on the dock. Um, how I need help. So I've got an F-150 and I've got that little generator in the back. I thought, oh, that'll run the AC. It won't. What can I do? Is there anything I can add to run that AC? I got that the pro power system on the back. And I, I haven't really researched into it, but I figured all this electrical talk, maybe somebody already knows. You're going to need a, a generator to give you a, a generator or a parallel uh, setup with like two inverter style generators that will give you that 30 amp receptacle that you would have at a uh, for shore power at a at a, a campground. So you need to have a generator with that kind of output. Um, the one on the F-150 isn't that. No, I didn't know I if there was something just that could handle the peak of it. Because I think once it starts going, I'll be able, the generator the, should work. I don't know if that's possible. The soft start uh, you were talking about, David, I believe, that would yeah. help. <clears throat> Did we disappear? Oh, there. Okay. Sharing. <clears throat> uh, I think that may get it there. Yeah, I've seen several folks that have bought the soft start and installed it. And it, it breaks out the air conditioner so that it, it doesn't all come on and have that huge surge at one time. It brings the components on one at a time and it minimizes the surge. There's lots of good videos on how that works in. But and they said it's a super, super simple ad, but it would minimize the challenge during that surge. So, so Dustin, what, what size power do you have? Or how many watts of power do you have coming out of the truck? Ah, uh, give me a minute to look. I think it's 2,000. Let me look. Let me look. Okay. Yeah, if it's 2,000, there's a good chance. And I have not mm -hmm. measured this. I am about to measure this. Um, when I run my air conditioner, 
when I've measured it up to this point, it'll run around 14, 12 to 1400 watts when it's running, but I haven't measured the peak because the I'm just using my surge protector and it doesn't measure that level, but I'm building a gauge where I'm actually going to measure every component in the base camp to see how much it uses. And then I'm going to have that little monitor on there and I'm going to turn the air conditioner on to watch the spike go up in watts and then come back down just to see if I can capture it. But uh, It's 2000. 2000. Yeah. So there's a good chance that you're heating greater than 2000, probably up to 3000 plus watts in that surge. And the soft start should bring that way down. So if you look for something like that, I think it would help. Good question. Greg, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Um, yeah, just uh, <clears throat> again, I guess uh, not, not exactly inverter related, but electrical related. Um, in regards to the, uh, the external solar panel plug that's on, the, on the outside of the base camp, um, can you, does anyone know, have, have anyone used that with, like what, do you have to use a solar panel that has a built-in charge controller or can you use could, like a, one without? Cause I was thinking of getting, for example, like a Blue Eddy battery, a Blue Eddy solar panel um, with just a little ZAMP adapter for the solar panel to plug in. But, but that solar panel, the 200 watt panel, but it does not have a charge controller built in. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you do. Um, oh. The power outlet on the outside of the camper is simply a connection to your battery. Uh, it's it's not. It says solar ready. It's good for attaching a solar panel. I have a, a little suitcase solar panel that we used with our previous camper, and uh, we'll plug that in there sometimes to give us additional additional runtime when we're boondocking for a week or so. But. Uh, but it has a charge controller. But it has a charge controller. You'll need a, a separate charge controller. And in fact, every group of panels, if you put if you uh, put even different brands or types of panels on your on your camper, each group would need its own <coughs> charge controller to, to I work efficiently. Because I, I noticed that the, the ZAMP panels come with a charge controller. On, if you order one on their website, for example. Um, but then I don't know if they would charge one of those external batteries, like a Blue Eddy or a, you know like that or a Goal Zero that. You could, yeah, those, you could think those Yeti chargers have built-in controllers. So if you bypass a controller on a solar panel that has a controller to connect to one of those battery packs, then you'd be all right. Okay, you can bypass. Okay. Okay. I think, Greg, yeah. the things to consider is that that connection coming in is a ZAMP connection. Mm -hmm. If you buy a ZAMP panel, you plug it in, it works. From what I read, if you plug in a Renogy or some other panel, or maybe a Blue Yeti, I think the wiring has been different. So you need to look at as a yeah. little adapter that you'd have to buy that right. reverses the polarity that lets that other panel. But you will need right. either to install, you can install a charge controller beside the one you've got and run the wires from that ZAMP connection to the charge controller and then over to the battery. And that way okay. you always, it doesn't matter which panel you use, you don't need to buy one. Or you can, uh, as Scott was saying, have an external controller either with the panels or I even saw somebody post in a different group today that they had bought a little um, uh, chart, a little yeah, a little controller to do that. But I, you, yeah, I would, sorry, I'm getting mixed up technically between the PWM, the PPT, and the others. But you'll need that one to manage, so you don't over over put too much voltage or anything to the battery and cause problems. Gotcha. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to ask: is can you install if you need a charge controller? Could you install just a second little charge controller in inside the, the yeah. like in between that? inside the base camp between the plug and the batteries. So that way. Sure. You could do that. Uh, one nice little thing we we had with our, our previous camper, and we use it sometimes here, we got an adapter to go from our solar panel to, um, to the seven pin connector. And that works with any camper. Mm -hmm. Anything that has a seven pin connector, you just plug it in mm -hmm. and then to your solar panel charges their battery. We've, we've actually saved a couple people out boondocking who had run out and we were able to charge them up with our portable solar, pan solar panel. So is that something you had to build yourself or, or did you, can you buy no, it? No, uh, it, it, uh, the, uh, the GoPower people that we bought uh, the suitcase panel from, that was one of their accessories and we bought that and, and it comes in handy mm -hmm. sometimes. Our previous camper didn't have any kind of solar, it wasn't solar ready with the official plug and everything. So 
we went through the seven pin and that works perfectly. Oh, nice. Okay, I'll look into that. Cool. Good <laughs> I hadn't thought about doing what, that, but that cable should handle that. Good. What What has been everyone's experience with the seven pin, with that particular pin that's supposed to recharge the batteries? I mean, how much does it actually charge the batteries? You, mean when you, you, should, you should be able to get, oh, depending on your charge condition on the on the batteries here, on my on on both of my vehicles, they're fused at 30 amps. Uh, realistically, you may get 15 to 20 coming through there if your batteries are low on the camper. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it it if you're driving down the road, it should it should keep everything topped off. Hmm. Okay. Talk about David, you're not getting that. Well. I, I need to I need to check it a little bit more. I mean, I've been on quite a few eight, ten hour driving days. Um, I just I, yeah, I need to uh, I just recently put the shunt on. I had the dongle, but I recently installed the shunt and um, which quite honestly, I like a lot better because it tells me how much battery I have left. As a matter of fact, I'm on battery right now. I just remember that I unplugged. <laughs> I'm at my daughter's house and I had this long extension cord to uh, plug up and uh, I thought it'd be nice if I mowed the grass today. So I had to pick it up so that I could mow and uh, I forgot to plug it back in. So I'm running on battery right now, but I have lithium and it does last for quite a long time. Uh, next, within for Neil, I'll just check. I didn't see Neil on today, but he had a question about he wanted to put a cell booster and he was looking for ideas to mount those. Anybody done something like this? I have not. I just, just before this Zoom call, I just watched a YouTube video of a person mounting their reboost. <laughs> um, they, they took the included mounting bracket that came with the kit and they they mounted it on the hinge of the back door, the, the topmost hinge. They just unscrewed the two screws and put the mounting bracket in there and screwed the, the hinge back on. Um, and then and then so it uses that the extender for the antenna and then ran the cable up the the like little gutter above the back door and in through the center little red light that he's already removed that light to mount a rear view camera there. So he just ran the cable right into that. Um, that looks like a pretty good, a pretty good way to do it. Everybody else, Brian? Now, the one that I've been watching on the, the back end, because I've looked at the weed boost and the others, we just do weekend camping or occasionally do something. Once I retire, I'd like to get out and do more. Um, and I've been looking at the MIMO and the WeBoost and all these different options. Uh, I watch a lot of the different channels of folks and there's one, uh, Irene Iron Travels. They just posted a video, I think today, they came back in and they're testing out Starlink. And so he has a good little video of what was working and doesn't work on the Starlink. Uh, because even with using something like the WeBoost, it gets you a bit of a bitter signal to some degree. But if you're a long ways away from the, the antenna, it still isn't gonna get you that much extra. And he was saying that uh, it was great for them for three years, but they were averaging usually about five megs to 10 megs down on the Verizon uh, MiFi that they were using. When he went to the Starlink, he was getting over a hundred megs down. Now that's also expensive. He's using the roaming option because they're full-time. So it made sense for them. It didn't necessarily make sense uh, for what we're doing on the weekend for us. Uh, but anybody is going to be out and doing it a lot of full time. Uh, it was a, a neat video from Iron, Irene, Irish, Irene Iron Travels of them testing out. And I think they'll post some more videos of what's working and not working because it wasn't perfect. I think the trees were blocking some of the signal, but a significant difference in download speed and upload speeds compared to the cell signal that you get. All right. So those were the top questions that we had for anything that had been submitted. Um, I see Jessica, you had a hand raised. You guys have a question?
We got two people working the computer here. Um, we um, are hoping to get our camper in uh, next month. Next month, sorry. <laughs> and we that's so we're gonna go back to our blue our blue ox question. And all I really need to know is we don't have our camper, and so the propane tanks. I'm wondering if how far they are back from the coupler, because our blue ox needs to like go over like this. And if the propane tanks in the way, I can't get it over like that. If it is, I'm good, but so I just need to know 29 inches back. <laughs> can I put my, 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 uh, H to B 29. Say what? So it need, you need to place it 29 inches back from the bar. From the coupler. Yeah. Okay. How, how wide is the the uh, bracket? Um, four inches ish. Four Just, inches. Yeah. I can go. I can grab a, a, a measuring tape. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted to happen. By the way, just someone go measure it. <laughs> now, are you picking up a sixteen or a twenty? Twenty. Okay. So. So are you are all three on a twenty? Say that again. I was asking Heidi, or if are y'all in a twenty X or a twenty? Yeah, uh, yeah, a twenty. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because it's slightly different on the sixteen, which is why I was asking. Yeah, and where your cursor was just a second ago, that's the part that needs to go over the frame. Right. So that way the frame. So what you're probably worried about is where the chain connects. Is that going to bump into the shroud? Well, no, because the breaker bar, or the, I have a breaker bar. And where that um, pivots on, it actually goes down and never goes up and above. So I'm just worried about the part that goes up and over. Well, that little part, because there has to be a screw that goes on the backside. And no one else has tried it, or they have a different kind of blue ox. And I'm just like, why aren't they talking about this? Is it a problem? So it's a very specific question. We recognize that. <laughs> No worries. I mean, that's why we're here. Let's see what we can do to help each other out. Um, I am, I've posted some pictures before of my installation. So I was looking to see, it won't have measurements, but I was looking to see how that fit in. Yeah. Um, if it would help. It's back. I'm back. <laughs> this is this is kind of a uh, a crude in the dark measurement, but it appears that between twenty eight and thirty three inches back from the uh, center line of the ball is where that space is that uh, Wayne would, I believe was talking about earlier. Uh, you may have to take the cover off completely to get your bracket on. But after that, it may work. So you have between 28 and 33 inches approximately is that space. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you for measuring that. That helped. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> I couldn't find a diagram anywhere. I looked and looked. So I was like, and not, I think there was just two pictures of, of the frame. So I was like, we better ask. <laughs> Because those brackets alone are for us are $300 to do to something different. So it'd be nice to use them again. <laughs> and like I said, you may need to remove the propane uh, oh. you know, tanks or something to get it in. But afterwards, you should be all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were hoping that was the case. But I was like, if the pro, you know, the L bracket was there right at 29, you know, it would block the whole apparatus. So but there might be some metal work to get around that. But anyway, that's all um, we have. Yeah, while we're going, I'll, I'll look. I've got a picture somewhere looking kind of up from the ground up into the shroud. As soon as I find that, I'll send it to my computer and we can, we can go from there. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I think you had a question. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's ever had um, an experience like this, but. <clears throat> Um, we did, uh, my family, my wife and I, we took their kids out and did a couple of days of boondocking 
and um, we were totally fine. Hot water, electricity, totally fine. And then we went over <clears throat> and did a four day stint at our local KOA with full uh, uh, full service amps hook hookups and everything. And uh, <clears throat> we couldn't get hot water. And for some reason, we I don't know what it was, but we had to, in order for us to get hot water, we had to turn off the master switch, turn off all the breakers, wait for like five seconds, then turn everything back on. And then I would hear the pilot light go on and we would get hot water for like five minutes. But then after five minutes, we would not get hot water. So then I would have to turn off the power, turn everything off and, and turn it back on again just to get hot water. It, it was a very strange thing. And um, I, I just, I, I had no idea what to do. So um, that's what we did for the four days. I guess we could have just, no, not hooked up the power. It, it, it was just weird because when we were boondocking, we didn't have any issues. But right when I hooked up everything, we had some weird complications. So I don't know if anyone ran into that type of uh, problem or not. Neither I'm bringing it into the shop next week um, to have them take a look at it. You had, you had any other power issues, Matt? Uh, no, no. The only reason I ask this is in the Airstream Maddox, I saw somebody post a solution today where they had been having these weird gremlin electrical issues and it was affecting different things. They didn't necessarily call out just the hot water heater. Um, but what they ended up finding is when they undid the, uh, the connection for the power coming in for the, the inlet for the short power, they found one of the wires was loose. So they oh. went in and tightened the connections oh. for your 30 amp coming in. And after that, all their electrical problems went away. So it wasn't actually at the other devices in the unit. It was actually at the initial power coming in. Uh, I have not had any problems between boondocking versus plugged in <coughs> just running into the, the hot water. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, we, I, when we were boondocking, you know, I was more concerned of like, are we going to have enough power just to make it for two days? And, and we did. So I, my, my thought process was, okay, we're, we're fine boondocking. Now that we have the full amp and everything, we were totally fine. But we came to realize that once we hooked up and the first night the, kid, the kids took a shower and we ran out of cold water, I was kind of at wit's end. Yeah. And I just didn't know what to do. And I, someone had mentioned, like, turn off the breakers, turn everything off and restart it, which someone posted on the previous Facebook. And, uh, and I did that and it worked. So I thought, OK, this is going to be a one time deal. And lo and behold, it, it didn't. It like within a half hour, it, we didn't have any hot water again. So for the so for the four days, we were whenever we needed to take a shower or something, I just turn off the power and <laughs> it did that, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, I don't know. You have to do. Right. It's a gremlin. All right. Well, now let us know what you find out about that. If I say anything, I'll ping you on Facebook for I've seen somebody yeah. else talk about that. I'll, yeah, I'll let you know once I bring it into the shop and they're going to take a look at it. Um, I'll let you know. Awesome. Um, all right, so it looked like we had a hand up from Jana Clinton. I don't think uh, he stepped away. Here he is. He's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, we uh, we don't get our trailer until uh, I think ten days, something like that. And we've never done a trailer before, so we are listening, and uh, we have no idea what's going on, but. We somehow decided to buy a generator and it's an EcoFlow Pro or Delta Pro and it's 3,600 uh, watts or amps. Don't whatever. Look at me. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so we, the thing weighs 100 pounds. Um, it costs 3,500 bucks. And uh, after we bought it, we started thinking, gosh, you know, is it, would it be better just to go with the lithium batteries and, because we're going to boondock for the most, we fly fish. And um, so we, we're in Utah and uh, we just want to be able to have four or five days um, go and come back. And uh, we saw this generator that would give us that ability. And um, without even knowing uh, exactly how much power 
this could uh, produce, you know, is it going to be able to run all of the 110s uh, for doing a little electrical things? And then can it run the, the uh, air conditioner and so on and so forth if we ever need it? And so we, I, you know, and again, probably, I don't know if anybody knows anything about that kind of a generator. It's, it's pretty much you charge it with electricity and uh, wow. takes about two hours to do that. And so I don't really know what I'm doing. And I just thought maybe if somebody had any experience with generators. Um, or should you go with the lithium batteries? Or the, or the yeah, Return. that or the lithium batteries. Um, Which way is the easiest? So. I don't, was that a question or was that just a <laughs> ramble? Sorry. I mean, let me find out, make sure I got it. And then I think Scott potentially and somebody else may have some feedback. Um, so you bought a, uh, a, what sometimes is called a solar generator or a battery generator. It's, so it's a battery that you charge up before you go. Yep. It powers up to 3,600 watts. You probably yes. need to know the amp hours that it totally has, the size of the battery. Right, because uh, amps is like how many yeah, lanes on the thing power? weighs a hundred pounds, and I don't even. Yeah. Um, so the, the specs to get into it, but uh, so you want to know how long is that going to last for you if you're off boondocking and doing stuff out fly fishing? Or should you? Well, if it? if or that, the or or do we do the lithium batteries and do the solar stuff? Um, uh, you know, and again, we were thinking about just. Uh, trying to decide by listening, asking questions. And um, I don't even know how to ask the question. Well, you're, you're, you're quick. Okay. So. I would like you to jump in. I'm a fan of solar. Uh, if the sun is, once you have your solar panel, the sun is free and it usually shines. Uh, we typically go to Assateague Island for usually seven or eight days uh, in November and when your when your usage demand is high because of furnaces and things like that and the the sun is low and the clouds are in the sky and with the the solar on the roof with the base camp plus our little suitcase panel we had no problems at all with this with the AGM batteries with we don't the AGMs. have lithium. yeah we mm. we were able to weather a couple of rainy days and uh and charge it back up when the sun came out. With the solar yeah. generator. Yeah, no, we don't kind of depends on camp usage, crazy. Right? Yeah. yeah, it depends on your usage. But I was worried about, uh, we, had never, we had never used the DC refrigerator before. And when we went this fall, that was a non-issue. That refrigerator, uh, I love it uh, compared to the, the old LP refrigerators. It just sits there and does its thing and uses very little power. Yeah. yeah, as I look at it, and then actually, if you search my name on YouTube, you'll see a bunch of videos. And one I did was a power audit where I bought a Honda generator, uh, the 3000 IS to carry with me. The, the thing's a beast. It's about it's about 250 pounds when it's full of gas. So I have to, had to buy ramps to get it up in the back of my Tahoe and get it back out. And so that's part of the reason I wanted to go to lithium batteries so they didn't have to carry that. But I'm not in Utah, I'm in South Carolina. In the summertime, you know, you can get by with that air conditioning and I know my ancestors did, but I'm not <laughs> as, as good as they were, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have done boom talking testing in the fall and I've posted some of those results in the Facebook group where I've got the two solar panels and the AGM batteries today. Uh, and we ended up using off and on, but we didn't have very much sun at all because we were mostly in the shade, right? It still did charge. Some of the batteries, um, I think we dropped from 100%. You can only go down to 50% on the AGMs, right? We got down to about 65% after two and a half days. That was mainly just using the lights, hot water heater, um, a couple of other things off and on, but not much of anything else. Uh, and that's, again, the shade on the panels kept us from getting full sun. And even when we did get full sun, it was only about an hour, maybe two. So it, it will let you do that. And that's part of the reason I said I was going to build a meter and I'm literally going to plug, I'm going to pull the fuses, disconnect the batteries, and I'm going to test as much as I can, lights, water heater, everything to see how much they draw when they're running. 
but we were running the heat that night with the propane and the fan, which requires a little bit. Uh, so if you're minimal usage and just using lights and occasionally the heat or the, the fan up in the ceiling, and you have sun recharging your batteries, you'll, you'll be good. Going from AGM to lithium, now uh, I've got two AGM batteries, 80 amps a piece, so 160 amp hours total but you can only use 50% of that. So I have 80 amp hours of usable power, right? If you go to lithium, you get, let's say you buy two 100 amp hour batteries. You can theoretically use all 200 amp hours. Probably better to leave 10% and not get below 10% on those, but it gives you a much longer period of time with lithium than it does. And they recharge faster than the AGM. Uh, and if, you, if the two panels on top are not enough, Shucks, I've even been looking at you know, what would I want to put on top of my roof or do I buy the external to plug in like Greg was talking about on the side? Uh, in Utah, it would probably last me a lot easier. In South Carolina, air conditioner, I've got to run a generator. You know, I don't have a way around that, right? I, go down, I went down to Hilton Head on my first trip and it was uh, 95 degrees in the shade and mm. about 80% humidity all day. We left the air conditioner running all day. And so in that instance, you're going to have to have a generator. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have no, we have no humidity. Yeah. I think you're probably in most cases, um, uh, what was this, what was the model of that battery you have? Delta flow. You mean the generator? Yeah. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's an Echo Flow Delta Pro. Um, it's, you know, and it's, there's no fuel. So it, you don't put gas and you don't use propane. It's just totally, you, you, uh, charge, it. you charge it up. At home, and then if you say you're, you're going to stay one night in a, in a trailer park or whatever, you plug that thing in again and just kind of keep, that's going perfect. with it but um it can be charged off solar panels as well but um anyway it just seemed like a fairly reasonable way of being able to just go not worry about batteries and things and just plug that thing in and it, it'll run everything but i don't know we're still kind of toying with everything so yeah so um i was trying to look at the specs online uh, to see how many amp hours. So I guess wait, wait, one way to I think about it, and you guys jump in, David, you've got lithium batteries, Scott, you've done a bunch of this stuff before, is the watts is, you know, almost like how fast you can go. The amp hours is how much fuels in the tank. So that battery is going to fill up with energy and how long it will go depends on how much you're using. So if you're only using and the light's only going to use 60, 70 watts at any one point. You can go up to 3,600 on that, the, that Delta EcoFlow, right? And if that's all you're running, you're going to go a long time before you run out of power. But then you got to throw in the refrigerator if you're running in. That's going to run about 40 to 70, depending on when the compressor is running. It's not a lot. So now you're up to 110, 150, right? And so, the um, and I'll look at the specs a little bit more on that box, but... Uh, if it gives you, let's say, 100 amp hours, and all you're using is uh, 200 watts an hour, then we just go in and do the math. Um, somebody, easiest way I always remember is wave. Watts equals volts times amps. And so if it's all 12 volt of what you're doing, and you're doing, let's say, 200, 200 watts at 12 volts, what is that? 240. So that's 2,400. Um, and then I don't go and do that. I'm not good at doing it right up front, but let's see. So that's 2,400. Was that 12 hours of doing 2,400 watts? So how many amp hours is that there? Let me get a pen and write it down. I don't know what it's It'd be easier to see for everybody. So, uh, Anna, Anna, is her last name Touche? Anna Touche that was on here last time? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, she, she's the one that recommended that to us. I think she's got one. Wayne. Okay. Uh, she's got several. So I was going to, I was going to recommend, you know, discussing this with her. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Anna would be a good source. Um, and she's really usually pretty quick to answer those back. She can tell you how long it's been lasting. And she's also in the Pacific Northwest. So it's a closer to what you're going to be running into versus what I run to on my side. So it depends on that use case will be good for you. Right. Um, in the meantime, I'll do some research and do some math and come back and look at it and see what I can figure out for you. Okay. All right. Dustin, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. So uh, can you hear me? I had to put my Bluetooth in. Are y'all able to hear me? Okay, sweet. Yep. Um, I would like to comment on the, the battery stuff as a, um, a newer person to this stuff. I need like a millennial uh, mode. Like I look at my battery that says 13.4. Like, what is that? Just tell me if I'm at 50%. Tell me out of 100%. And then now I'm being told I got batteries that I can only go to 50%. Like, that seems like a scam. But I wish they would change that to, to, to millennial mode. My question um, I have, and I'm sorry I didn't put these ahead of time. I've got the TST boosters on my uh, on the trailer, and they keep dropping signal. They sent a booster for it for the I guess for the Bluetooth to, to reach the truck where my monitor is. If I hook that up to a battery, do I have to disconnect that when I store it? I store it inside so the solar doesn't help and there's no electricity. Do I have to disconnect that every time, or will not draw enough power to to affect it? Let me ask the question again. Sorry, I was doing some math on the back end. On the, uh, the TST, the uh, on your uh, for the tires for the yes. tire pressure monitoring system, I'm not getting enough signal. Keeps dropping from my truck, so I saw that they sent a booster. That booster looks like I can attach it to the battery. My question is, when I store it, I don't have solar and I don't have power. Do I need to remove that, or is that draw not existent? Do we know any? If I leave it on there, is that going to be a problem? Uh, it it does use a little bit of power, so though it would be like a parasitic draw because it's going to use a little bit of wattage, but not a whole lot. Um, I I installed the Tire Minder i10 or whatever it was, and so it came with alligator clips. So I clipped those on, and when I put it in storage, I unclipped them so that it doesn't connect. I tried putting in a um, uh, a little power switch and I did something wrong with a little toggle switch. It was a wondrous glow of burning wire when I put it on the wrong way. <laughs> um, so then say I almost burned down my base camp early in the first couple of weeks I had it. So yeah, uh, depending on the length, I'm, I don't have any problem with my, my truck on the I-10, but if you put that booster in, use the little alligator clips and just put it on your positive and negative. And then when you aren't using it, unplug it, it probably only uses, I would guess, Dustin, five watts max. And if you've got the solar panels that are adding more than that every day, it's not going to be a problem. It's just for storage. It's in, It's covered. I don't know if the panels, will do, I doubt they'll do anything. And then, of course, when I went by and saw it, I saw my little sewer light was on. So that made me anxious as well that I'm burning my, my battery there, too. At. Yeah. Good question. All right. What are the questions we have? I think we've kind of gone through all the submitted questions and a couple of the others. Where do you need help? Any good stories to tell? David, are you still in break right now? No, I'm back. Or, oh, all right. <clears throat> yeah. For those who don't know, the last time we had in February, the office hours, David was at Breckenridge and lots of snow and cold weather in his base camp. <laughs> having a good old time and wishing, all the rest of us were wishing we were there. I told my wife, David, because she was always afraid of being cold. And on the previous, the last time we were together, I told my wife, yeah. there was a guy who was like living in the snow. <laughs> and he said he was totally fine. So to, I, I, used, you as, I well, used you as an example, and she took comfort in that. David, we go out yeah. there a lot. Where were you staying? Are you staying at that, that uh, RV Hi. Riddles resort area that they have out there? Tiger Run. Yeah. Tiger Run. Yeah. Yeah. 
Really not. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah, we looked there. You can actually buy those lots and then they'll sub it back out to or rent it out for you. Yeah. But it's the exactly. only place in Breck, exactly. it looks like, or in that area. Cool. Greg, looks like you had your hand up. Um, yeah, quick question. Yeah. If anybody has um, done anything, like the, the the walls of the bathroom, like the, they're, they're just gray. Has anyone done anything as far as like, like either painting them or putting up um, like any kind of like that kind of like uh, stick and peel kind of wallpaper for any kind of like other colors or textures or anything there. Does anyone know if anything works well or doesn't work well? I, Somebody this past week I saw posted. Do you see that, Dustin? Yeah, I I don't know. I saw somebody months ago. I take screenshots of all the stuff I like that I've seen for the last year, and I saw somebody had put the stick and peel on their bathroom, and I'd asked him how it uh, held up, and he said okay, uh, but I never followed up with him. I'd be curious to know because my wife saw it and she loves it. Yeah, there was somebody in one of the groups. Um, I don't know who it was. I, I scanned through it where they had put up pictures, they had painted different colors, different parts of the, the wall, Greg. Uh, I haven't. Ours is just, it's just the metal at this point. Uh, I know Cass Beach and her 16, because she was living in it. Um, the, the wall, when you're sitting in the back and looking forward to the wall next to the bathroom, she had put wallpaper and some other stuff there on hers to decorate. Mm -hmm. so, there, so there are a couple of folks that have done it, but I don't know what would be good. Anybody else have thoughts on that? This has been, yeah, this has been some time back, but there was a guy that posted, uh, he actually designed, they're like, you know, the fat heads, you know, like you would get of sports players, or whatever you put on your wall at home. He actually did one. It was a, you know, a forest scene that he put across the back, you know, either side of his back door that was pretty nice. And so the way it goes up, obviously you can take it down quite easily too. But it's like a fat head. All right. Other questions? I think Heidi and Scott had your hand up. Yes, this, I don't know if this is a question or, or just I'm looking for ideas. The only thing that we haven't really come to terms with with the base camp is the on-demand hot water heater. Um, that, that burst of, of cold after you shut, you know, you, you get hot water, it runs a while, you finally get hot water, and then you shut it off, and then you have a burst of cold again. And we did just buy another shower head. Uh, that has a positive off, which might, uh, instead of dribbling and getting a whole lot of cold, that might help that. But what do other people, what do you guys do to deal with the, the burst of cold water? Like when you're, we take like a military style shower as we have in, you know, we're, we're campers for many decades. So, you know, you turn the water on, you soap up, you turn it off, you soap up, you rinse. And so every time you stop, you get this you know 20 second long yeah how, how do you deal with that yeah ice cream <laughs> <laughs> well we're doing that now <laughs> but our previous camper had a regular tank style water heater and we actually used a lot less water showering uh, with that because you could turn on turn your water off and on without that blast of cold Uh, what I do is, um, and I've seen somebody else in the group post this, is we turned our hot water down to uh, like 105 degrees. And when we take showers, we only turn on the hot water. And so it doesn't have the hot and the cold coming through. It's just hot water demand. I do have a Oxygenix shower head that I changed out the one that was in it. And so I'll turn it off. When I turn it, if I take a long in the military shower idea, if I spend a lot of time with the water off, now turn it back on, there will be a, a little bit of cool water comes in because it's not constantly heating because there's no, it only heats when there's water flowing through it, right? But the easy, easiest thing that's minimized that for us because we ran into the same thing early on was, uh, and my wife agreed it was good, we just lowered the temperature and only used the hot water and we don't seem to have nearly the number of problems we had before. 
we, we've done that that thing and it helps like you said it's not it's not as nice as the tank style yeah. either we haven't come to that yet yeah, we were pretty excited to have this you know tankless on-demand water heater like oh wow that sounds really fancy and then we actually started using it and it really wasn't that awesome <laughs> <laughs> but for everything for everything else it is yeah i mean yeah. that's the only little complaint yeah if you plug it into city water fantastic right because you non-stop hot water Sure. Yeah, we've camped like that oh, actually, like one yeah. time in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> we usually are set up on the neighboring farm. And, yeah. You know, we're yeah. there for a week and a half. So yeah, we don't we don't camp that way. <clears throat> Is it fairly easy to adjust the temperature of the hot water? Very easy. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's a button, up down button, like a thermostat. Yeah, oh, okay. Sounds easy. <laughs> yeah. Very easy. On on the water heater note, I I know that we had this problem and probably a lot of other people had trouble uh, with the water heater running in cold weather after you've had the power shut off, the gas shut off. Uh, you, you're, like when you're traveling. When you're traveling or when you're sitting in the cold, uh, it's a freeze protection feature for the hot water heat heater. Uh, we did install a kill switch on the hot water heater so that we could, so that it wouldn't sit there and try and run half the winter. Uh, to try to light. That's part idea. Yeah, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We were trying to leave, and we camp in cold weather mostly. And the water heater kept trying to kick on. Like, well, everything is turned off. We are getting ready to go. And uh, there was there were some other posts on one of the groups explaining that this was a safety feature. <laughs> it's like, well, it's not not very handy if you're traveling yeah, in cold weather. You either need to pull the fuse or install a switch. In, in line someplace. That's like the I direction. Pull the switch. Yeah. I'm pull the fuse, sorry. Right. The, the instructions that are on the unit are in French. They are, and, they are in French. And they refer to a kill switch, but the English instructions don't. <laughs> so <laughs> somewhere there's supposed to be a kill switch in there. Interesting. Cool. What are the questions or topics? I bought the tent and I still haven't used it yet. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Yet. Have you set it up at all? Not, not yet. Even okay. one of these days, I'll set it. It's for my kids so that my wife and I can kick our kids out. But the thing's a beast. I didn't know it was going to be that big. Holy moly. Yeah. Jeez, yeah. Please. And the instructions, I don't do well instructions. It's like a manual, like an Ikea. And instructions like, are terrible. Yeah. They're terrible. Stuff. We we did use it in the snow uh, the week after Christmas this past year, and it, it basically doubled your living space. Uh, we set it's, up a we set up a sink out there. Uh, we mm -hmm. put a blackstone grill in there under the under cover, and we were really comfortable. Mm -hmm. It is it a beast, though, it, and it doesn't work with every campsite on our farm. It doesn't matter because the space is flat and vast. But if at most campsites, like at state parks, they're really too narrow to, yeah. um, to because you need a wide, flat spot for it. But we thought we killed it in the snow because if we came up to check on the camper and the, the tent was flat, like completely flat. And um, we took it all apart and um, took the um, inflatable pieces out. And no easy task, by the way. Um, but blew them up then and stood them up in our garage to see where the leak was and it stayed up stayed up for uh, apparently one of the fittings had, <laughs> so. had come loose in the cold or was leaking in the cold so it's fine oh. but the, the, the tent is really nice once you get it up yeah it's a beast though to get there i wouldn't if we were moving around a lot i wouldn't use it just because it is such a beast but it is does make you some nice space well i'm looking forward to setting it up and it's, it's a two-person job, isn't it? It's not like one person. Okay. <laughs> it's a two-person job. It's so heavy. Uh, do you have a, the X or the regular version? The X. Your, 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 base, your base camp. See, X. ours is, we don't have an X. Um, so I would be concerned about the height because ours is barely. Um, it, it, it will reach. Will it reach? Yeah, it'll reach. Uh, I did find that the door... Uh, the door does kind of hit the tent a little bit, and in the with the X, it may even 
the, the, the angle of the roof, the connecting piece may be a little more severe. So okay. you may need to slide it forward and back mm -hmm. on the on the base camp a little bit so that you can get the door open reasonably. Gotcha. And when you mount it, do you, when you mount it, you just, do you take that strip off on the top there and you slide it in and, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We, we actually cut, cut it, we wound up cutting the strip into a couple of chunks, like a chunk the size of the tent um, where it, you know, where it stops and keep the, ch the chunk for whatever reason. Um, yeah. But you do need to kind of play with it a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, we put it all up and we staked it down and then we realized we couldn't open the door all the way so then we had to unstake it and then we wound up moving it more to the front than we originally thought we needed to and um so it's it's a it, it's a lesson in experimentation there, it took a couple of tries <laughs> there's a learning curve yeah yeah okay can't wait <laughs> thank you it does fill with water though um or the first time we had it up we had horrible rain and the, the floor is such a high quality floor that it held inches of water. It was like a, it was like a water feature, like a pond <laughs> that was inches deep. I thought the floor, there, there's a floor in the, in the tent. I thought it was just floorless. Yep. There's a floor in it. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. That All holds right. water. It's very sturdy. You could take a bath <laughs> out there. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Uh, Clinton, have your hand raised? Yes. Um, I had a question about um, extensions on your hitch so that your tailgate can come down without, um, you know, going into the, I don't even know what you call it, but do, do you, is there, is there a, a certain amount of extension you need to use to be able to put your tailgate down without hitting i haven't okay. used a, an extension Did anybody use one i i have not but your extension will alter the uh, weight capacity of your hitch uh, the, on the on the truck, so as you add length to that hitch, it'll reduce the amount that that hitch is rated to, to carry. Uh, you would probably have to contact the hitch manufacturer for exact specs. So yes, you can extend it a little, but don't go too far. Right. I was just I I didn't know whether that would have an effect on weight distribution and your tongue weight uh we just got a we got a new i retired and i bought a new truck and a new trailer i know nothing about the truck and i know nothing about the trailer and now i'm uh just kind of swimming so think think about your your hitch like you would the seesaw back on the playground the farther you get away from the pivot the harder a small amount of weight will have more effect on on the seesaw. So if you get way far away from the truck with an extension, a little bit of tongue weight makes a big difference on the truck. So that there's that's the, the delicate balance you're going to have. So the, the least amount of extension that you can get can get away with is is the right amount. Right. I just I just looked up the equalizer. Uh, hitch and it just looks like there's about 12 inches that you could extend it um, where you put the pin in but I I wasn't sure if like you're saying whether that's a, if that's a good thing or I wasn't sure um, what to do because I know that if I've got to be uh, taking that jitter out of the truck, just wanted to be able to over the top of the truck bed. It makes sense what you want to do. Uh, I think Scott's right. You just need to look to see the further you go out, how much of an impact that's going to be. Um, I, I've seen other folks talk about buying, or like where I switched to, instead of the manual jack, I switched to an electric. You could turn the electric sideways. 
And I've seen people do that so that they could lower their tailgate without having any problems. But you'd have to measure to see if that's still going to be enough or would you need an extension and what's the impact for the extension? Okay. Cool. Good question. What else? Anything else you guys want to cover tonight? War stories, things you've done wrong. Everybody laughed at afterwards. I'm just gonna say I gotta I gotta jump off, but uh, I wanna say thanks to everyone for the info and thanks Wayne for organizing. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Greg. Hope this is helpful. Yeah, very very helpful. Right. Yeah, Clint, like you're talking about being you. Um, I think the second time I'd ever taken my camper out, we're dropping my daughter off at college. Instead of staying at a hotel, we figured, oh, we'll just carry the base camp. We'll stay there. KOA was a long ways away. It was the only place I could find nearby. It's about 30 minutes from campus. Pull up in the middle of the night. It's about 1030. And come back up and set my little uh, plastic blocks down for my uh, jack. And as I'm setting, this is before I bought the electric, as I'm moving the jack, all of a sudden the whole base camp, my wife's inside, the whole base camp, <laughs> drops off of the blocks like what in the world I like, get out of the base camp it wasn't her fault it was mine I had chalked the wheels in the front because it was a little bit of a downward slope so I was having to raise it up a good bit what I didn't consider was that the gravel that the plastic blocks there was a rock and so the blocks weren't level and the blocks were sideways in the hitch I mean the jack just slid right off the blocks <laughs> onto the ground and because there was no chalk on the back of the wheel, the wheel could roll backwards. And so the, uh, the passenger door side, the wheel stayed there, but the driver wheel moved backwards because it slid off of those blocks. Luckily, the guy uh, from the campground was going around in the, brought a flashlight around because I'm there with my little nerdy headlight, as my wife calls it, trying to figure out what in the world I did wrong. I'm nervous as a cat because what in the world did I do wrong? Finally realized there was a big rock under, get it back up, had to hook it back up to the car, reset everything back, put it back again, make sure the blocks aren't going to move, and then get it back down. And then my wife and I decided at that point, nobody goes into the base camp until I've got it set and I got the stabilizers down. Because with her moving around and me doing that, it was just enough for it to slide off. So it was a bit scary. Didn't cause any damage, but it was definitely a lesson learned. This isn't a base camp, but our very first trip out, out in the wild, um, we learned a valuable lesson in the dark about figuring out exactly how long your extension cord is <laughs> before you unhook, level, and get everything set up. Um, people who are new to it, take note of that. You only do it one time. <laughs> They got to yep, rehook back up, remove. Yeah. Yep. All for six inches. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It, it was a hot night and we did need the air conditioning. Yeah. So otherwise, we would have just roughed it. <laughs> cool. All right. Any other questions, thoughts, stories? Did, have, have our. Have our already shared the story about how I was trying to thaw out my um, dump area uh, when I was in I think you talked Ridge. briefly about it last time. Uh, I already you... shared that. I don't want to bore you. No, go ahead and tell them, Dave. So, well, so I, the base camp really is not four season. I mean, the design, the, 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 um, Everything going to the sink is on the outside wall over the wheel well. That froze, so I insulated that, and then I took some reflectix and put it between the, the, the lines and the wall to kind of separate that, and that worked fine. But the tank heaters work, but guess what? The t those tanks dump into you know the little, the little pipes that come out of the, whatever the, into the manifold that you dump with, and up, up to the point where, you know, your little levers are keeping it from coming out. There's stuff there and it freezes. So I had an issue with that. So I bought a, uh, 
I bought a uh, heat lamp that sits on the top of an LP tank. And it's, it's really nicely designed. It's not too expensive. It sits right on the top. And so I have a third with me. Um, so I set it up, but it's a little bit too high um, for where the, where the dump area is. And so I kind of had to angle it a little bit, you know, and then I wanted the heat to focus on that. So I took some reflectics and I built like a little hut over the top of it. And this worked. And I actually was able to times. So I was there for a couple of times. And so I was trying to get it done right before I left. And I think I absentmindedly, as I was leaving it, I'd set it up and everything. As I was going, I was going to go inside, walk around, go inside the base camp. I think I must have laid my gloves on top of the reflectix. And, you know, that's thin stuff. There's no structural integrity there. And it pushed it down on the top of the um, heat lamp. So I, I stepped up into the base camp and all of a sudden I told my, my friend, I said, I smell something. He said, yeah, I do too. And so he gets out and walks around and he starts hollering and he is, I go around there and I mean, we had a fire. We had a fire on top of a propane tank. He's out there. <laughs> He, he's out there throwing snow on it, you know, just as fast. I mean, he didn't have a shovel, and he just got his hands and throwing snow on it and everything. A couple of people were walking by, and they saw it. They ran up to see, make sure we were okay. And, and long story short, it really, it really didn't mess a whole lot of stuff up. Even the LP tank had some, some of the melted reflectance kind of on it, but it, it still works. But can you imagine what a tragedy that would be? <laughs> Yeah. That thing had exploded or something. Oh my God. So I learned, I learned a very important lesson there, but I really do wish that they would have, uh, you know, especially the X model. I mean, it's touted as being something you're going to take off road and people that are going to go off road are, they're going to be in cold weather and they should put that area down there in a box, you know, that you can open up and then you got your handles and your place to connect some way that you can keep that heated because it's going to freeze and you're not going to be able to use it. And, you know, I don't know any really good way of keeping it thawed out. Um, I think I've solved the, the problem with the pipes on the inside, but that's a bad design and shouldn't be like that to begin with. I mean, why would you put it, put the, put them right up next to, an aluminum wall, you know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So anyhow, don't do that. Don't do what I did. You may not be as lucky. <laughs> sure. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I actually looked, David, I was trying and debating that I want a four season trailer when I was looking at the base camp. The, yeah. the one I'd really been looking at that was somewhat touted as being four season was the, um, the Black Series, the HQ yeah. 15, 17, 19, 21. Uh, but they're 10,000 pounds, so yeah. I don't have to buy a new truck to pull it. And they're nice inside, but they're an Australian yeah. company. So yeah. some parts are coming from China. Australia, from Australia. yeah. And so it was all those other types of things. Yeah. But then I was watching RVs of America, which was the one big reseller in the U.S. And they were doing testing because they're in Utah of coming in and putting other materials to try and insulate the underneath to truly make it a four season uh, trailer, but they were struggling at mm. that point. I think they did a pretty good job, and some of the folks liked what they had done, uh, but it, it still was a, mm -hmm. a bit of a challenge. And then, obviously, the outside pipes was always another challenge as well. Uh, right. But, but yeah, it'd be nice if it was really there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like I've said previously, though, I the furnace worked great. Uh, my front vent does not have much CFM coming out of it, so I supplemented with a oil filled electric heater, which did a marvelous job. And even I've, I've, I've noticed, I mean, I'm, I'm in Virginia right now and it's fairly, you know, temperate here, but there's a big difference in how warm the back part of the trailer is in the front part, you know, because even with the, uh, with the uh, heater mod where you've got the vent underneath the wardrobe, which that's the way mine came. I was lucky. I got that from the factory. 
that works extremely well. And then you've got the vent that's way back in the back that's kind of underneath the bed. I did see a picture uh, that someone had posted where they actually had a vent coming up from the back. <laughs> yeah, had a little R2-D2 hose coming up. Um, but the one up here, it just it's just not putting out. And even if it put out a lot, I'm not sure how well it would how well it would warm the front, but it's not a huge issue because, you know, my other heater certainly kept me warm. And, and I mean, we had, we had some of the coldest weather they've ever had in that area. I mean, we're, most nights were sub-zero. And, but during the day, it would warm up. And, of course, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. Certainly, if you're somewhere where it's warm and, and you, you might want to run your air conditioner, a little bit of sunshine will heat these bad boys up. It'll, it'll definitely, it'll definitely heat them up. So during the day, my pipes would unfreeze and even before I insulated them. Um, but it is an issue for uh, four season camping. I'd like to say that uh, I'm thinking about doing this with my base camp. Our previous camper, we used Frostex heating cable on the exposed pipes and around the valves around the dump valves and yeah. then uh, and then and it did a good job insulating them and we've camped into the wow. into the teens occasional single digits with that camper and we're able to still work the valves uh, when it was time yeah. to leave so i'm considering doing that with this one too yeah i insulated them uh, and I even bought some heat tape, but honestly, the problem is where do you plug in the heat tape, you know, uh, because what the, the park that I was in, they wouldn't allow you to use their, their little 20 amp receptacle because they were using that to keep the water. They, you know, they had their own heat tape. All of the water was in a box. They had a, this, it was enclosed in a box, which was nice. And they have their own, you know, way of keeping that from freezing. And they were using that 20 amp outlet. And I mean, it was very specific that you were, you were for, forbidden from using that. And they even had, they had a light on the top of that box that was somehow connected to that 20 amp breaker too. So if they were driving around or whatever, they saw that that light was out, you know, they would know that there was a, an issue there, maybe that, that their pipes were freezing. But so I, um, I did use, I did use the uh, external um, uh, outlet on the base camp, but I had a heated hose also. So that had to be connected somewhere also. So after a while you run out of, you know, power and outlets for all of these things like heat tape and, you know, other things that need to be, uh, connected like that. I even bought for my for my water. I actually had two heated hoses, and I had the clear source system. And they just recently introduced. It's a bag that you put it in, and it plugs in, and it's supposed to be good down to minus ten. And I used it when I first got there, and the temperature went immediately below zero. It froze. So I had to take that out of the system and just use one hose, just a direct connection to their water source. But, uh, but my, um, my heated hose worked famously. Of course, I insulated where it connected to the source and to the base camp. You know, I got those little neoprene, you know, the little uh, kind of 90 degree deals. And I put that around then put some more insulation and wrapped it and all this kind of stuff. And it worked fine. Cool. Anything else for anybody? Questions, stories? All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, once it's, uh, it's finished recording and storing on the PC sometime tonight or tomorrow, I'll upload it to YouTube for anybody that missed it. If you have any questions, anything I can answer, feel free to, to reach out. But the whole intent is exactly what we did. People telling the stories, this is what I've done, what worked, what didn't work, mistakes you've made. And then, oh, by the way, how do I do this? Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll do some more of these in the future. But if anybody has questions, just ask in the Facebook group. And I'm sure one of us will try and jump in and try and help out. 
Well, have a good night, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Bye. Bye now. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you all.